in our third week already of our series on reset, going back to the basics. I got some stories this week. I'm really excited to share them with you. And if you if you if you went on Facebook, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you can friend request me. Go for it. But I posted last night. I'm so excited to share what God has put inside my spirit and my soul this week because I feel that it really could change us. We've been we've been talking about this this idea of reset, starting over. Starting fresh, going back to Jesus, the whole reason why Jesus came. And then I preached last week about loving God with all of your heart. And what does that look like? How do we need to be reset with loving God with all of our heart? And today's message is entitled, How Do I Love God, Loving God with All of My Head? In my old church, at, in my last church, we, we did this thing called H3 Discipleship. It's heart, head, hands. H3, three H's. I don't know what it is about threes, but God is Father, God is Son, God is Spirit. Preachers like to preach messages on threes. I don't know, there just seems to be this, this thing with threes. So like, we're, we're talking about how do, last week, how do we love God with all of our hearts? This week is how do I love with my head? And next week I'm going to be talking about how do we love God with our hands? But resetting ourselves back to that idea. And it got me thinking, I just was like, all right, God, let's, let's read the passage. Let's read the passage. In Matthew, or not Matthew, in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, this is what we read last week, we're going to read it again this week, we're going to read it again next week, starting in verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, and he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And I talked about last week how the very first thing is it's a response. It's a response to listen to God. And then he goes on to say this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Yes, that's four things. I'll get to that in just a minute. Love, and the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no, no other but him. To love him with all of your heart, with all of your understanding, and with all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Focusing in a little bit here, verses 29 to 30, Jesus' response, Jesus' response to the question, what's the most important thing? Jesus says, to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Today we're going to be talking about that idea of the soul and the mind. Loving God with our soul and with our mind. And, the, and, the, and we're going to just kind of put it all together. The reason I said that our head is because when this, when this scribe answered Jesus back, he said this, to love God with your heart, with all of your understanding. All of our understanding is our soul and our mind. It's our understanding. It's, it's what goes on in our head. So how do I practically love God with my head? Because it just doesn't make sense. Because in our culture, especially, love looks like this. Oh, I get this warm, fuzzy feeling down inside my heart, and I love her. Oh my goodness, I think I love her. I'm going to say, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say I... <laughs> that was good. <laughs> love is so much more than an emotion, and and we read this at weddings. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we read, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it's not rude, it's not selfish, it's not self-seeking. It keeps no record of wrongs, it doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always hopes, it always perseveres, it always trusts. Love never fails. That's 1 Corinthians 13. Love never fails. 
But in all those things that I read, it wasn't about emotion. It was about a conscious decision that you made with your mind to love. To love like God loved. To love is not just an emotion. It's not something that you just feel. It is with your head. You have to make a choice sometimes to love. Because love is patient. And to be patient, it takes this fight that's going on in your mind, and you have to make a decision to be patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. Well, what is boasting? Boasting is saying, look at me. Look what I did. Look what I did. Isn't that awesome? That's not love. That's boasting. But you're looking, you're thinking about your own accomplishments, and you're boasting about them. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Well, what is pride? Pride is thinking, look how good I am. But no, love is humble. It's thinking about, really, I am nothing compared to God. So loving has a lot more to do with, with our mind than I think we typically give it. I mean, we, we throw love around out there like, man, I love this pizza. It is so good. That cheese just, oh. That's, we throw love out there like it's just this thing. What does it look like to practically love God with your head? Not just your heart. Not just your emotions. But what does it look like to love God with your head? And like I said, there's this thing with threes. Not only are we going to talk about loving God with all our heart, head, and hands, we're going to talk about today three practical ways to love God with all of your head. I don't know why. It's just goes like, okay, it's three. Okay. But these are really, really important. The very first thing, the thing I want you to understand, one of the best ways to reset our mind is to start thinking rightly about who God is. If you want to love God, we need to reset our mind to really love the person, the God. We need to know who that is. If we don't know who it is that we say we love, we cannot love them. We love this idea that we think about. So what does it look like? How do we think rightly about God? And I've shared this passage before. I'm going to share it again because it's one of my favorites. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Paul writes this. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the entire body, everything in it. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. To worship God. And then he goes on to say, This is how you do it. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I think a lot of us, when we come to God in faith, we come thinking wrongly about God. We have these false perceptions of who God is. And, we, and the world has gave them to us. The world that we have, we have conformed to this world's image of what, who God is and what God is. And, and, and we start thinking wrongly. I call it stinking thinking. We have stinking thinking about God. Our, our, our thoughts, they stink because they're not right. And if we want to love God with all our, our mind, with all of our heads, then we need to get our right thinking about who he is. So let me just give you an example real quick. God is a joy killer. God does not want me to have any fun. The world will tell you that, right? That's why you don't want to become a Christian because, man, those Christians, they're dumb. They're stupid. They have no fun. You, you can't have sex. You can't do anything you want to do. Get no amens. God is a joy killer. That's what the world will say. That's what the world will tell you. But what is the truth of what Scripture, what God has revealed to us about himself, teach us? It says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24, that there is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in all of his work. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. 
Listen, so God doesn't want to be a joy killer. God wants you to enjoy the things that He's given you. He wants you to, to, to love life and experience life. But the reason that there are some things that, that He says, hey, don't do that, is because of the repercussions of what doing that will happen and cause in your life. He knows what's best for you. It's not to be a joy killer. He doesn't want you to commit adultery because he doesn't want you to walk down that road of what it looks like to destroy a family. God's not a joy killer. There is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in all of his toil. That is truth of what God is. Stinking thinking says God's a joy killer, but right thinking about who God is says not. He has given me a life that is so precious, and he wants me to love it and enjoy it. Here's another example. Well, God will solve all my problems. We've heard that one said. We say that one sometimes ourselves. God will just solve all my problems. But here's the truth of the scripture. Jesus says, listen, in this world, John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trials, you will have trouble. But take heart. Take courage. I have overcome this world. Listen, guys, God's not just going to solve all your problems when you come to him. He's going to say, listen, I will walk with you through your problems. That is truth in Scripture. There are so many more examples. I could preach for two hours on this. But the point is that we have some stinking thinking that needs corrected. And the best way to love God is to go to the Scriptures and learn what he says is true and write about himself. Because that's what he has chosen to use this word to reveal himself to us. In, 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 in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we read this. If we're going to let the word reset our mind, we need to know the truth is found in the scriptures. For the word of God, scripture, is alive. It's alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. Here's the it divides the thoughts, the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. That's what the Word of God does. That's what the Word of God is really good about doing. It is alive, it's active, it's sharper than 20, any, any, any weapon the man can forge, it's sharper. It can divide your soul from your spirit. Because it knows, God knows you, it's alive, and when you go to read it, He can reveal Himself to you in it. And if you can read a passage one time that means absolutely nothing to you, and two months later, because your life has changed, you go back and you read that same exact passage, and you're like, oh, I've never seen that before. Oh, that's good. God, thank you. Because the Word is alive and active, and it can pierce you down to the deepest part of your being. It can judge you, your thoughts, your intents, your attitudes, and your heart. The Word of God is where we start when we want to start thinking rightly about God. If you want to start loving God, spend some time getting to know who He is in His Word. One of my favorites, <laughs> I don't know if I should say it's not really one of my favorites, but one of my jobs as a husband, and I don't do a great job with this, I need to get better. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. I'm pretty, I'm pretty decent at loving my wife. I would say I have a lot of work to do. But this is where I really need to work, this next part. He loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. A husband's job is to love his wife so much and lead her spiritually to cleanse her by the washing of the word, which will make her, using the word of God to wash her soul. That's what Christ did for us. Christ is the word, right? And if Christ is the word, what he did for the church is he came to be with us, to make us holy. He is our holiness. He is our righteousness. He is everything that we could not be. And the husband's job is to love his wife so much like Christ did. To be that example, to wash her with the word, to use the word of God to lead his household. I think we all, husbands, need to do this. But this isn't just for us, this is for everybody. If you want to get washed with the word, if you want to find holiness and cleansing, if you want to present her as a radiant church, 
We need to be a person that's dedicated to the Word of God. To correct our stinking thinking. Second point is this. We want to love God with all of our heads. We need to start thinking rightly about ourselves. You need to start thinking rightly about yourself. I think Satan has done a very good job of getting us to believe lies about ourselves. And we read this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. Be alert and of sober what? Be alert. Be alert and of sober mind. Okay, so you guys are alert and your minds are sober. You ready? Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Be alert, guys, in a sober mind. Keep your minds clear. Are you ready? Your enemy, the devil, prowls around looking, roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. And here's, the, here's what Peter says. He says, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Listen, I think Satan has done a marvelous job. If he can't get you to think wrongly about who God is, he's going to do a great job of getting you to think wrongly about who you are. See, the world says, and the world gives us this picture of who God is all the time, but the world also gives us a picture of who we are. And I, and, and I found this artwork online. And it, some of them are kind of silly, but they'll, they'll illustrate my point. It looks like this. The world says, your life is in your own hands. But the Word of God says this, that your life is in His hands. The world says this, believe in yourself. In yourself you will find all the power that you need. But the Word says believe in God. Believe in His power, in His sufficiency. The world says live, <laughs> you only live once. You all know, right? You only live once, so live however you want to live. Regardless of the consequences of who gets hurt. God's word says this, you only live once, so live it like he wants you to live. Live it for him, for his pleasure. The world says, this one's really good. The world says, I need somebody else to complete me. Someday I'm going to do a series on singleness. And it's not just singleness and being married. I'm saying like singleness about who you are as a person, and how your whole person, see, single represents a whole individual. And two single people coming together do not complete each other. They can't complete each other. God is the one that completes them together. He makes them one together. The world will tell you that you need somebody else not Jesus. You need somebody else to make you happy. You will find your happiness, your joy, your contentment in somebody else. And guess what? What happens when that person fails you? What happens when they leave? What happens when you screw up? You leave them. You're no longer a complete person, aren't you? The danger with this is we don't correct our stinking thinking about ourselves as we are left in a state of brokenness. Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy. Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around in a roaring light seeking who you will devour. So, I have a couple more examples. I've talked about identity before, I've talked about lies before, and how we can correct them. But real quick, a lot of lies that we believe. One of the most, one of the biggest ones is that I am worthless. I am unlovable. That's a lie that many people struggle with. You know, the world will tell you very easily that you are worthless, that you are unlovable. But what is the truth of God's word? John three sixteen. Why would say we, we know it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The truth of God's word says that you are loved so much that God sacrificed his son for you. His only son for you. 
when you start correcting your stinking thinking about who you are to God, revealing those lies about your soul, this, the, the, the foothold that Satan has over your life is not nearly as powerful. You start to break down those walls and those barriers. Another one is this. This is a really good lie. It's a really tricky that lie. I am what I do. It's how we define ourselves when we talk to other people, right? Hi, I'm Joe. I'm a pastor. Hi. I used to say, hi, I'm Joe. I manage Pottery Warehouse. Or, I'm the GIS technician for Potter County 911. Oh, well, what's GIS? See, we define ourselves by what we do. Whether we're a carpenter, whether we're a mechanic, we define ourselves by what we do, our profession. And, 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 it, and, it's, and it's a scary trap to fall into because when we start believing that, that our identity is tied up in what we do, what happens when you lose your job? What happens if you have an accident and you can no longer do your job? What happens when the world falls apart and you're left thinking, hold on, no longer a pastor? <laughs> what am I? What do I do? When we define ourselves by our, by our, our, our profession, and, and Satan attacked Jesus in the wilderness, asking, going after three very important lies, his, his popularity. You, well, if you are the son of God, then jump off. Surely the angels will catch you. His popularity, his, his profession, and he also attacked them by his possessions. What he owns. Well, I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what other people think about. Those are three scary lies. Those are three lies that many of us believe. And we need to correct them because God's word is that you are his child. The basis, the very, very foundation of your identity rests in the fact that you are a child of God. And once you have that secure, no matter what happens in your life, you could lose your job, you could lose all your stuff, you could lose all your friends, but your foundation rests upon the rock of what Christ said you are. You are a child of God, deeply loved, loved so much that he gave his life for you. That is your identity. And we renew our mind, we reset our mind by the very same thing, by going to the word of God and finding out what the truth is is what he says about you. Oh, I'm just getting started. This is what I'm really excited about. You guys have no idea. Are you ready for this? The last thing. The last thing. God gave you a mind. He wants you to use it. In the beginning, in the beginning, very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is a creative being. And then he goes on to say this in verses 26 to 20. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals, over all of the creatures that move upon, along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature, creature that moves on the ground. Yes, I said creature on purpose. Because God is a creation. God create. God, God, is, God creates. It's the only thing that we know about God so far. He said, let, man, let, let us make man in our image. And what's the one thing that God has done so far? He's created. He is creative. He is expressive. He has he is thought about what he wants to do. And then he spoke it. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. God is a creative being. He has created you in his likeness. He has given you a mind to think. And with this mind, he wants you to use it to love him by being creative. 
What has God placed inside of your soul? What vision has God given you for your life? What does he want you to do that he has given you a passion and energy for? What does he want you to do and then create to do it? What are you passionate about? What do you want to go for? Because one thing that he has done so far, he says in the beginning God created. God created. And you're made in his likeness. You can create. Guys, what separates mankind from all ever living creature? The thing up here between our ears. That we have a mind. And with this mind, we can communicate the thoughts. The things that go on up here. And we can create. Go back with me on a journey, 300 years. 300 years from today, what was life like? Start giving me some examples. From our 1700s, what was life like? Do you have a cell phone? Do you have a car? Do you have indoor plumbing? Do you have computers? Did you have pretty much anything that we use on a day-to-day? Do you have a washing machine? She got a new washing machine yesterday. It's amazing. <laughs> Guys, do, your life right now is so much different, so crazily different from somebody that lived 300 years ago because people had a dream, had a vision, had a creation that they wanted to make something. They wanted to make life different. And guess what? Look what we have today. I have a device in my pocket that I can view what's going on on the other side of the world. More seconds. Because we are made in the image of a creator. Has God given you a dream, a passion, or a vision for something in your life? You can love him with all of your mind by using what he gave you. Ask him for a vision, ask him for a passion, ask him for something, and then go after it. And this is your I got this card in the mail yesterday. Some of you might know what it is. I'm kind of ashamed by it. This is a Starbucks gold card. My wife looked at me. She's like, you know you buy too much Starbucks coffee when they send you a gold card. I said, yep, it's, it's got my name on it. I was sitting at the coffee shop the other day and I was having a conversation with a young man. And I asked him for permission to share this because it is so amazing. God placed him on my heart a couple months ago. I walked in to to, 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 to Starbucks and I was sitting down working on something. This kid's going to town on this table next to He's got like these sheets of paper that are two by four. And he's like marker up going crazy. He's got something in his head that needs to come out on paper. And he's writing it down. I'm like, what's he doing? I'm curious, what is this kid doing? And then he gets up and leaves. All of his stuff is on the table. And when I say gets up and leaves, I mean, I watch him walk out to his car and drive away. I mean, like his phone... Every, his, like, there's stuff on his table. And I'm like, what is this kid doing? Ten minutes later, he walks back in. I'm like, brother, you've got a lot of faith. Mind you, this is a couple months ago. I said, you've got a lot of faith. He's like, well, I said, you just walked out of here and left all your stuff there. I said, oh, it's okay. He's like, I need another marker. <laughs> he had an idea, and he needed to get this idea on paper. And he just had no... Other thoughts and is going through his mind that I need another marker so I can get this idea finished. So he left. He just went and got his marker and got, he started working again. A couple months go by, I find out that this kid actually works at Starbucks and like start developing a relationship with him. It came down, I was, I was, I went to talk to him the other day. This is on Tuesday. I went to talk to him. He was, he was on break and I said, Hey, can I ask you a couple questions? And he sits down and he starts, he's like, he starts sharing. We, we had talked a little bit before about faith, and I knew he was saved, and I knew he had a relationship with Christ. He goes to a couple of the churches. Like, I'm like, I'm, I started to know a little bit about who he is, but I never knew his name. I see, and so he introduced himself as Jake. And I said, well, nice to meet you, Jake. I'm Joe. He knew I was a pastor. And uh, and we started talking. I asked him some questions. He's like, 
man, I got an idea. He's like, I don't want to, can, can we get together sometime so I can share with you my idea? It's like, yeah, I'd love to hear your idea. And so he's got this, he's like, I only got like five minutes. He's like, I know you, I want to ask you some questions right now. So I asked him some questions and, and then he's like, well, I want to get together sometime with you and share with you my ideas. I'd love to hear about it. And I'm like, he's like, well, do you have a card or something? So I handed him my card. It gets to be Friday. And I get a text message. I said, Joe, this is Jake from Starbucks. <laughs> He's like, I realized I never told you my last name. My last name is Ames. I don't know if that name sounds familiar to some of you maybe in here. But I learned later that his dad is Rob Ames. And Rob spoke here right before I got here. And I went to a training of Rob's because Rob's a discipleship trainer. And, and I realized that we, we had this connection. He's like, man, well, can we get together? So like, so the, we can, like, I'm looking for a mentor and I'm looking for somebody to invest in my life. I'm like, dude, this is awesome. This is a pretty cool God connection. But then we're sitting down on, 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 on I think it was on, on Friday. Yeah, we're sitting down Friday afternoon and we're talking about his idea. And he brings out this, he's like, I got this shirt. I just came in the mail today. And this is what he was working on that day. It's this shirt with a hand on, of Pennsylvania. He said, my idea is this. It's hands on Pennsylvania. That's what I'm calling it. He's like, he's like, so many of us just complain about things that bother us. He's like, and it just drives me crazy. We just complain about things. that He's like, and so I want to start asking people, well, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to put your hands to work to change Pennsylvania? And he's getting these shirts made up because he's got an idea. God gave him an idea, an idea that was birthed to creation. And he is putting it to work. And he is, he is so excited to change Erie with this idea of what are you going to do about it? How are you going to use your hands to change Pennsylvania? I was like, Jake, can I share this on Sunday? He's like, yeah, please. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to start selling the shirt soon. But you want some support. But I want you guys to see this as an example that God has birthed something inside each of our souls and He wants you because you are created in the image of a Creator to put hands to the plow and get to work. To love God with all of our minds is to use our mind and then to go for it. We're going to talk about that next week using our actual hands. Mission, to love God with our head though, means to think rightly about Him, to think rightly about ourselves, and then use this thing between your ears that He gave you to love Him, to serve Him. Am I the only one that's passionate about this? This is good stuff. Guys, you are formed in the image of a Creator. Create. Tony Robbins, Jake actually shared this quote with me on Saturday, or Friday. <laughs> and I wanted to share with you. He wrote it's a quote by Tony Robbins that says this. He said, Never leave the sight of a goal without first taking some form of positive action towards its attainment. See, we can think that we're solving all of the problems, the world's problems, all the time. And Christians are really good about this. We are really good about having a Bible study, studying the Bible. And saying, yeah, that looks good. And then we think, because we studied about Francis Chan uses an amazing analogy. He's like, listen, if I, if I tell my girls to go clean their room, and they come back down three hours later, and they say, Dad, I know you told us to clean our room. I know you told us to clean. So we, we, we sat down and we talked about it, about how we could clean our room. We developed a plan. This is how we could clean our room. He's like, and then, then we actually looked up what it meant to clean our room in the Hebrew. Oh, it was amazing. He's like, but if you don't actually do what I've asked you to do, you've just wasted your thinking power without putting your hands to the plow. We can spend so much time thinking that we never do. Don't get stuck. Affirmative action, positive action towards goals attainment. Clean the room. What has God asked you to do? 
for your good. So will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for this message. Lord, I pray that if we don't know what you've asked us to do or called us to do, or if we don't have a vision or a dream or something that we want to go after, Lord, I pray that you will give it to us. <laughs> I feel like praying that prayer of, of Robert Duvall and the Apostle. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. Lord, I just want you to give vision to your people. I want you to give passion to your people. I want you to birth inside them something that they can create and they can take positive action towards its attainment. Father, let us not be so overthinkers about things that we never do. But let us give us opportunities. Give us vision. Give us dreams. And let us love you not only by thinking right, studying your word to figure out who you are, who we are, but actually doing what you've called us to do. That's what you are passionate about, is seeing people obey what you ask them to do. So Lord Jesus, I pray this by your precious name.